I'm finally getting around to using this 12 color set of gouache, the Iridori Winter Assortment from Holbein. Hi, this is Inkworks, I'm Irene, and I first showed this box in a holiday video from December. It's a special assortment of winter-themed colors, a part of Holbein's seasonal Irodori series, which also includes spring, summer, and autumn sets. I'm a fan of Holbein's gouache, and the colors here are fabulous additions to their basic color lineup. The autumn and winter ones, at least, I don't have spring or summer, yet. I say yet because although I have more than enough paints to keep me busy, producer Mike likes to surprise me, so just leaving things open-ended. The paper for this session is Fluid Brand, 100% cotton, hot press. It was actually my last sheet. I do like this watercolor paper, so I'll have to make a note to get more. Using a polychromos colored pencil, I sketched a plan. The inspiration came from Japanese patterns, like those seen on fabrics and decorative papers. Don't let the name fool you. Holbein is not a German company, but rather a Japanese one, and they've been manufacturing art products since 1946. According to the official website, their headquarters are in Osaka, with offices in Tokyo and factories in Kosaka, Hiraoka, and Nara. In addition to oil, acrylic, and watercolor paints, they produce 89 colors of gouache. Unfortunately, they can be a bit pricey here in the U.S., but fortunately, deals can be found. I like to keep my eyes on Amazon because prices there seem to fluctuate frequently. While editing the footage, I realized there was only one coat of color on my nails, which was annoying because I'm a two-coat gal, former chronic nail biter here. So these past 15 years, I've been living my best nail life. That doesn't stop me from unfairly judging others. That's right. I'm not above raising an eyebrow over some poor YouTuber's ragged edges, sloppy lacquer work, and encroaching cuticles. So I know someone out there is doing the same while watching my videos. Really? You couldn't be bothered to apply a second coat? That's it. Unsubscribed. I worked with a limited palette of five colors, blue-black, hummingbird blue, peony, Riku gray, and antique gold. I may be half Japanese, but I never learned the language. That was partly due to my own short-sightedness, but also to limited circumstances. I'll explain. You see, my mother tried to teach us, me and my seven siblings, the Japanese language, but none of us were smart enough to take advantage of the opportunity. Ugh, Mom, when will we ever need to know Japanese? So she eventually gave up. In junior high, I took the Exploring Foreign Languages class, a crash course sampling half a dozen languages. Well, tragically, my high school only offered Spanish, French, and German. You can imagine my envy upon learning 15 years later that my nephews took Japanese classes at their high school. Man... The point is, that's why I didn't say the Japanese names for those colors. Believe me, I'd be happy to show off if I could.
I love having mixed heritage. I believe that's what inspired me from an early age to research other cultures. It's an endlessly fascinating subject. Being raised by my mother, I absorbed a lot from her, yes. But even after she was gone, I continued to learn about Japan. From food, to history, to geography. Okay, mostly food. It's been a long time dream of mine to one day visit Japan. But at this stage in life, I doubt I could handle that kind of trip. I mean, people keep saying it's hot, it's humid, and it involves a lot of walking. <laughs> no, thank you. Any one of those things is enough to keep me away. Not even a curry shop at every corner could make me endure a sweltering Tokyo summer. Besides, I can get Japanese curry blocks right here at the supermarket. Or if I want a better price, I can head to the next town over for their Asian market. Don't ask me why there isn't one close to me. We have two freaking Walmarts, but no Trader Joe's or H-Mart. If the ugly stage of a painting gives you hives, you might want to skip ahead. However, if seeing the process and the progression interests you, just let things run. Most of it is double speed, so hopefully it's not too torturous. By the way, having a lot of color choices is nice for those who aren't into mixing. Although I'm happy with the ones I picked, I ended up mixing a couple of them with Rikyu Gray at the top of the dish there. That was just to get the values I wanted for this piece. I was thinking the shade blue-black reminded me of indigo. Well, I checked the tube and it's made up of PB29, which is ultramarine blue, and PBK6, which is lamp black. So it makes sense because there are plenty of indigo hues out there that are simply mixes of blue and black pigments. Look, maybe this is all watercolor 101 stuff, but my brain doesn't retain info the way it used to, which is a handy excuse for undone chores and getting caught watching Inception for the fifth time. No way am I going to confess to my obsession with Tom Hardy's voice. Here at Inkworks, it's okay, because there are like 16 regular viewers who are loyal and kind and would never betray my secrets. But back to Indigo. Apparently, NB1, which is natural indigo, and PB66, which is synthetic indigo, are both fugitive meaning they are not light fast and will fade in sunlight. Keep in mind that I'm talking about pigments here. Indigo dye is considered highly light fast. So although indigo dyed fabrics can fade from wear, they should not fade from sunlight. Yes, I know it's confusing, and I'm sort of regretting bringing it up in the first place. But it ties into the whole Japanese connection, because indigo is a big part of Japan's history and culture. I understand indigo pigments, dyes, and their related products, such as clothing and household items, were traded with the Portuguese and the Dutch as early as the 1600s. But I guess there were issues? So Japan adopted a policy of isolationism that lasted a couple of hundred years. When trade was re-established with the Western world, Paris welcomed Japan's presence at their world fairs. The result? 
Japanese indigo became internationally fashionable. But not just indigo. In fact, in England, it became quite trendy to decorate one's home with Japanese goods. Thanks in part to a popular exhibit in Knightsbridge during the 1880s. It was called the Japanese Village and was made to look and feel like a traditional Japanese environment with houses, artisans, and performers. It was the inspiration for Gilbert and Sullivan's biggest operatic success, the Mikado. That's right, I managed to sneak some GNS into this video. If I weren't already a true nerd, I'd wave some finger guns right now to cement that status. There's a wonderful sequence in the film, Topsy Turvy, that shows Gilbert and his wife visiting that Knightsbridge exhibit, and it was enthralling. The whole movie is brilliant, really. One of my favorites. But now that I've brought up the Mikado, I want to address a sensitive topic. And that's the fact that there are some who feel the Mikado portrays Japanese people in an insensitive manner. Let me say right now, it's understandable to feel that way. As a GNS lover, I can see there are stereotypes on display, and I am all for updating every one of GNS's Victorian era works to reflect our more enlightened time. I also feel that Gilbert was no more making fun of the Japanese in the Mikado than he was of the Italians in the Gondoliers. Because just as with the fairies in Iolanthe and the feminists in Princess Ida, Gilbert was, first and foremost, making fun of the British. My opinion isn't the only one that matters, though. As a grown adult, I realize that's not how things work. But after decades of listening to GNS's comic operas, attending live performances, studying the librettos, reading reference books, and even borrowing Asimov's annotated Gilbert and Sullivan from my public library four times, I think my opinion is at least an informed one. It was around this point that I started mixing some Riku Gray with Peony, and later on with Hummingbird Blue. One of the joys of gouache is that if you make an oopsie, you can fix it. That's the magic of opacity. Now might be a good time to go over the brushes that were used. I think there were five in total, uh, starting with a one inch silver white stroke and moving on to a number eight snap filbert, a number two umbria bright, and wrapping things up with a number two select round. According to wordhippo.com, irodori means coloring or color scheme, and I could expand upon that if I'd only learned Japanese. My lack of bilinguality haunts me so. The painting was getting there, but things didn't start gelling until I used Riku Gray to outline the shapes. I should point out that although I may never get to Japan, my nephews made it there twice. I could be consumed with envy, but I know very well that reality rarely matches the fantasy. And my fantasy game is strong. So I'm content to imagine myself as an elderly woman haggling at the fish market, pickling a bunch of cucumbers at home, then walking to the nearest izakaya to knock back a sahi beer like nobody's business. As you may have guessed, I was raised on rice. 
my mother used to take me along to the Asian market, where I would quickly find the candy section and ogle the boxes of Botan rice candy, the tins of fruit-flavored Sakuma drops, and the bags of white rabbit milk taffy. I'd eventually make my way to the back and stare at the tanks filled with live fish and seafood. When I'd had enough, I'd join Mom at the checkout, where she paid for tofu, natto, umeboshi, beni shoga, bonito flakes, nori sheets, a bag of white rabbit milk taffy, and a 50-pound bag of rice. You might be wondering, but Irene, you must have been a strapping young girl to lift 50 pounds. No, no. An elderly man with a stoop hoisted that thing onto his back and carried it to the car. The point is, we went through a lot of rice, and not once did I ever encounter a weevil until one day about six years ago. I opened our 10-pound bag of rice, cutting carbs, you know, and freaked out over small dark things moving inside. I'm not kidding. It was somewhat traumatizing, and simply throwing away the bag didn't solve the problem, because those things had already infiltrated and laid eggs inside other staples in the pantry, such as flour and cornmeal. It took weeks to rid ourselves of the buggers. On the upside, I can't think of weevils without remembering the mealtime exchange in the movie, Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. <laughs> Hall of Fame dad joke that. I'll add a link in the description. I challenge you to name a better movie that's set on a sailing frigate during the Napoleonic Wars and starring Russell Crowe. I dare you. Oh, oops, producer Mike just popped in and said, stop being bossy. So if you're still watching 17 minutes in, I'll express my gratitude. Thank you. That goes for fresh new viewers as well as familiar returning ones. The final touches in antique gold were the cherries on top. When pouring antique gold onto the plate, it struck me as overly bright, even yellowy. But it worked great there. It's probably my favorite element of the piece. It might sound like a no-brainer, but who of us is running on all cylinders anyway? So the next time you're art-blocked, Maybe tap into some sweet, sweet heritage. It worked for me, and it can work for you, too. I'm happy to share this gouache painting project. Yeah, I'm happy. I broke into some new supplies, created art, and got some stuff off my chest. When, when, when? Until next time, remember to be informed and stay Irodori, my friends. For a good portion, this piece looked very mid-century modern. It didn't feel Japanese until the final details, which, in my opinion, transformed the painting. Anyway, I was getting strong Showa vibes. Japan's Showa era lasted from the 1920s through the 1980s, but I'm referring to the mid-century portion, which some call post-war Japan, specifically the 50s and 60s. I picture a lot of cigarette machines, pachinko parlors, and kaiju movies, you know, Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and Gamera. <laughs> Never mind that 1950s Japan is considered their golden age of cinema, with several Kurosawa classics. 
But no, I go and pick the monster movies. <laughs> that was all I knew as a kid, because our TV stations liked to air that stuff a lot. They called it Saturday matinee or something, and it was always some cheesy old black and white creature feature. <sighs> Man, I am so glad for modern streaming services.